Live Chapter 3. This is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love every Saturday. And God is addressing his people, those who have an ear to hear <clears throat> and a heart to heed. All right. Jeremiah Chapter 3. Excuse me, y'all. I'm still hoarse from that cold. So pardon my voice. And that is the reason I'm not on screen. <laughs> I am a sight to behold. And trust me, you do not want to behold this sight. <laughs> All right. Starting at verse 22. <clears throat> starting at verse 22. Return ye backslidden children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee. For thou art the Lord our God. <clears throat> Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of the mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame and our confusion covereth us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. You know, a lot of times, this is me now, this is Pat's two cents. A lot of times we think, you know, that we're okay because we're in the dispensation of grace. We're saved by faith. We walk, you, you know, we're forgiven by grace and Jesus is on our side and, you know, he is our advocate. <clears throat> he is the propitiation for our sins, which means he is the pleasing sacrifice. But listen, you guys, <laughs> the one thing that God has always shown me, in spite of the fact that we are in the dispensation of grace, and it's not by works that we're saved, but works maintains our salvation. And we have to remember the, the Bible does say faith without works is dead. And it describes how the devils believe, the demons believe, and they tremble. <laughs> but they ain't saved now, are they? All right. So just making that point for those of you who feel like all you need is, is your faith. That's not all it takes. That's all it takes to get saved. That's not all it takes to stay saved. You hear me? All right. So here we go. Matthew. Oh, let me share this. It's popping in my head. In the Old Testament, they talk about how when they were dealing with the law, I think it was the Levitical law. They In the, in the, five, the first five books of the Bible, that's the Pentateuch. Well, in Deuteronomy, it talks about how children who are disobedient, and that's what we have in this day and age. You know, we know that's prevalent now. Children who, children who are disobedient to their parents, who are rebellious, who are openly rebellious, openly, I mean, just there's nothing the parent can make the child do to, to bring them in line. They are just running wild, like wild oats, wild weeds. They're just out there. Like like untamed animals. Well, you know, back then, the penalty for a disobedient child was to be killed. Yeah. Here, we don't even want to allow corporal punishment, which is a simple spanking. But back then, they were killed, y'all. So, see, God didn't play. And because we're in the dispensation of grace now, many of us think, it's playtime. We can play. We slip, we slide, we peep, we hide. Now, the one thing the Lord revealed to me years ago, when a person is right with the Lord, they love being around God's people. They love being around the word. They love hearing the praises of God. They love being around the church, the atmosphere of the people of God, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. They feel wonderful when they're in that atmosphere. But the person who is not right with the Lord, guess what? They feel very uncomfortable around God's people. They feel very, 
they, they look at you as if they've got something to hide because they know they're not right with God. And they're hoping you don't know it. They're hoping you don't see it. It doesn't matter if we see it or not, y'all. God knows. So if you're not right with God, the one temperature gauge, don't stick the thermometer in your mouth. What you need to do is you need to check yourself. When I get around God's people, how does that make me feel? That right there will tell you. When I get around, if I go to church, do I feel like I just want to hurry up and get up on out of there? I don't want anybody talking to me. I don't want no hugs, no handshakes. I don't want no prayer. Just, 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 just let me get, get to, get to stepping. This is just over the top, too much for me. Is that the way you feel when you get around God's people? That's a very good indicator that something is wrong in Denmark, y'all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something ain't smelling too swift. In your heart, in your spirit, in your life. Do you know how you know that? When you look at the book of Genesis and you look at Adam and Eve, when they committed that sin, what did they do? What was the first initial instinctive response to their sin? They ran and hide as soon as they heard God's voice. They ran and hide. They hid themselves and tried to get fig leaves to cover themselves up. We always try to cover our sin, don't we? But you have to remember this before you go too far down that road. If you cover your sin, God will expose it. But if you expose your sin, <clears throat> God will cover it and you. He'll cover you. Excuse me. When you want to do right, you tell on yourself. That's another temperature gauge. When you really want to do right. I remember I was sitting in church one day. <clears throat> to show you what I'm talking about. I was sitting in church. And there was a, a couple, they were dating. You know, you could tell they were dating for quite a while, at least a couple of years. And um, I remembered how uh, uh, we were sitting. It was kind of like Sunday school. It was a Sunday school setting. And the teacher was passing the mic around. I don't know what led them to do that. But when that mic was getting close to me, the Lord was burning in my spirit to address sexual sin. And I was like, okay, Lord, this is Sunday. I mean, not Sunday school, Saturday school, either way. It was, it was at church. So the mic gets in my hand and I had to do what the Lord told me to do. And I said, I don't know who this is for, but the Lord is letting you know, he sees you sitting up here in church. You look nicely dressed. You look pretty, you look handsome, but God wants you to know he watched you coming out of the sheets together last night. And he knows that you are committing repeated sexual sin. Now, I just shared whatever else I shared and then I passed the mic on. And I'm sitting there like, oh my God, Lord, these people are gonna look at me crazy. They didn't ask for a word from the Lord. They just wanted us to say a little something, something. But I had to share with God laid on my heart to share. It was already burning in me before the mic got in my hand. So what I want to share with you, God knows what we're doing. He saw me when I was committing my sin. And I felt his anger. See, I'm not talking like somebody who never messed up. I know what it feels like to feel God's anger. And guess what? I know how scared I was too. I was copping, please, begging, borrowing, spitting, sputtering, crying, sobbing, doing everything I could to get back on God's good side. And I got my act together because God's anger scared the boo-boo out of me, y'all. The problem nowadays in the church and around this world in these last days, 
one main ingredient is missing, y'all, and that is the fear of the Lord. We feel like because we are in the dispensation of grace, we can do, we can run, we can play, we can skip, we can peep, we can hide, we can lie. No matter how many people you have fooled, God knows, y'all. When God asked Adam and Eve, where are you? He wasn't asking them, where are you because I can't find you. He wasn't playing hide and seek. And he wasn't asking where they were as far as location goes. He was making them think, what have you done? Where are you spiritually? Something is wrong. God knew they had sinned. He wanted to hear what they would say about it. So the best thing to do when you know that you're not on the good foot, tell it. Like the song says, tell it like it is. Tell it, y'all. Because if you don't tell it, God will show it. You don't want that. Because that's part of his, when he says, he chastens those he loves. He does. I always say you can avoid the booty whooping if you're up front. If you're up front and honest, you can avoid that booty whooping. You can. Not saying you will, but you can. But if you're not up front and honest and you're slipping and sliding, you're hiding and hiding and hiding, sooner or later, I remember, listen, I'm going to share this with you because I want you to get what I'm saying. I don't know why this is on me like this. I hadn't even planned on talking about this. But I want to go on and put it out there. Before Milton and I got married, we messed up. Now, I won't say how many times either. But I stopped preaching. I would not mount that pulpit till I got myself together. Because I don't play that. But let me tell you this. Milton told me one night he woke up. Scared the mess out of him. I broke up with him shortly after that. And we were broken up for almost a year till Milton called talking about let's get married. And the Lord let me know that was his doing. All right? Because we gave it up for him. He gave it back the right way. But Milton had a dream that we were kissing in the church and we were smooching. And he had pulled a curtain like a hospital curtain all around us so nobody could see. And he said this old woman snatched the curtain open, pointed her finger into his face and said, God's going to judge you for this if you don't stop now. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to tell you is when you're in relationship with God, you can't hear from him. God will warn you. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you. Don't let him get you to the point where he's got to take you to the woodshed. God blessed me and Milton because we obeyed. We broke up for his sake. We wouldn't even talk on the phone, y'all. I couldn't handle talking to him on the phone. I loved him too much. So I didn't want to see him ever again in life. I never went to that church. I went to my own. I found another church to go to. I wouldn't be anywhere around where I didn't go to the stores he went to because I didn't want to run into him. Not because I was angry with him. I was trying to obey God. My motto is I ain't losing God for nobody. I don't care how much I love him. I ain't losing God for nobody. So when you look at the scriptures and you see areas, I'm going to try to look them up. So when I upload the video, but it's coming to me now, there are times when God actually says he, he will divorce. Mm -hmm. He He's married to the backslider, but there comes a point where he actually says out of his mouth, I will divorce you. So you have to be careful not to play games with God. You can be religious all you want. You can know the scriptures backwards, forwards, upside down, and inside out. But if your stuff is messy and you're not bringing it to the light, 
Now, I'll be honest with you. When I was slipping, I wasn't hiding. I was telling it because I had lost control. And that's why I knew I had to break up with Milton. Some of you, you lost control, but you ain't breaking up with nobody. You just enjoying it, baby. And you just like, hey, whatever. You have thrown caution to the wind. Listen, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's sexual sin. I don't care if it's gambling. I don't care if it's out there lying and deceiving people into giving you, into giving you their money through uh, hook or crook whether you're doing a business or you're doing whatever kind of schemes out there. I don't care if you're cheating on your wife, cheating on your husband. If if you're out there looking at young women you ought not be looking at, you may not have done anything, but if you lusted and going back in the corner, exercising your muscle, <clears throat> yeah, I'm telling you, God calls that lust. He calls that fornication, even if the act has not been done. See, God's level of standards are so high. We don't realize how high his standards are until we get in relationship, until we start reading that word. God does not play. And he wants us to know. See, some of us, you know, we, you're, uh, we may not be living in sexual sin. We may not be gambling. We may not be out there uh, lying and cheating and scheming and conniving. We may not be a Jacob. But we may be one of those that will knock you on your fanny in the New York Minute. Don't get on my bad side. Well, see, you got to be careful about that, too. See, some of y'all, when your temper rises, you get to cussing and throwing, and next thing you know, you got a whole hissy fit, or you got an adult temper tantrum, or guess what? You're knocking somebody on their behind before you know it. Some of you men, you don't know how to open your mouth and articulate your feelings, so you let your feet and your fists do it for you. Something wrong with that, y'all. Something wrong with you. When that's the only way you can express your frustrations. You, some of you, you got houses with holes in your wall. Why? Because you're punching them. You're kicking them. You're throwing things across the room. That's an anger issue. And God says in his word in Psalms 37, forsake wrath. Some of you ain't forsaking wrath. Some of you are dancing with it. You're obeying all of his orders. Here's something that, that really is comical to me. This is a sick mindset, and it's something that happened uh, last week. A member of our church, their apartment ended up being burnt. Why? Because there were some squatters. Squatters. I'm trying to get the words out. <clears throat> Squatters. What a squatter is, is a person who slips inside of a vacant house or a vacant apartment, sets up camp and lives there, not wanting to pay for it. They just want the enjoyment of a freebie. Now, when they finally acted on the complaints of the residents and got the marshal to put them out, this is now this is this is where I call it really sick. They actually had their mitigated goal to think they had the right to get angry for stealing. That's literally stealing. You're not paying your way. You grab something that belongs to somebody else, you're stealing, and then you get mad because they caught you nerve. What is that? You don't have a right to get angry. You're the one who's in the wrong. So they set it on fire. For those of you who want to rip somebody off and pop, pickpocket and, and, and do whatever you're doing, you get angry if, the, if they call the cops on you. Why would you get angry? You're getting what you deserve. Why would you get angry? You are trespassing. You putting your hands on somebody else's body, taking something that doesn't belong to you. How dare you get angry if you get caught? 
See, there's a mindset in this society. It's it's a feeling of I I deserve that. That I ought to be able to have whatever I want whenever I want it and you better give it to me called entitlement. Nobody owes you a thing, baby cakes. They worked for theirs. You do the same. The Bible says, if you don't work, neither should you eat. Hello. All right. So we have to get out of this thinking, thinking. We have to get out of thinking we can do whatever we want to do, whenever we want to do it. And God just got to understand. God doesn't have to understand a doggone thing, y'all. Not one thing. The problem is he does understand. He knows you better than you know yourself. I don't care how much charm you pour over it. God knows the crap that's under the charm. He knows what's really laying under. He knows the stench. He knows the rottenness that lies under the syrup of your charm. He knows it. So I have a comforting word for God's people. God says to you, he gave me that scripture as well. Come unto me, all ye that labor, Matthew 11. He says he will give you rest. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. That's your word. You don't have to worry because God understands the load you're under. He understands the burden you're carrying. He understands the responsibility that's been thrown on you. He understands how some of you are being blamed for things you didn't do. Some of you are having things piled on you and piled on you. I'm thinking right now of what I would call my niece from across the pond. She cracks me up. This is one of our <clears throat> our online subscribers, our online church members, so to speak. She, every single time I upload a video, she watches it. And she just sent me a cry about how she's being treated on her job. Well, I share this with you, you guys. That just came to me now, just remembering that. God wants you to know that he knows and he has the next step prepared for you. So no matter whether you keep your job or whether you don't keep your job, God's got you covered. All of you, all of God's people that are trying so hard to live a holy life where the sinners are abusing you, the sinners are accusing you, the sinners are raking you over the coal. God's got an answer and a solution for you. There's a song. That, now, this is for the, the saints of God that really need some comfort. Listen to this. Out of the fire to the flames of another trial. When you think that your heart has had all it can take and nothing is there left to break. In the heat of the fire, he will pull you through. When you don't understand it, he is tried and true. No matter the problem, God has an answer for you. Starting all over, praying that things will get better. You've done all you can do. You said all that you can. Then you're back where you started again. But in the heat of the fire, he will pull you through. When you don't understand it, he is tried and true. No matter the questions, God has the answer for you. So when the rain falls hard and the storm winds blow and you think that it'll never blow over, trouble under your feet, nothing over your head, mm, mm, mm. and you think it will never blow over and you can't find cover, God has another plan. Know that God is working things out for you. God is working a way of escape. God is working another route. God is working your solution. Your answer is in God's hand. Cry out to him. Fall on your knees in your heart. I'm not talking about physically. It's the position of your heart, not your body. 
Cry out to him. Fall prostrate before him in your spirit. Worship him. Bless him. Praise him no matter how you feel. Praise him no matter how the people make you feel. Praise him no matter how victimized you feel. Praise him because when your praises go up, blessings come down. And God knows. He knows you're hurting. It's called a sacrifice of praise. That's what that is called. Help me, Lord. It's called a sacrifice of praise. When you sacrifice your praises, when you obey him till it hurts, and you give him your praise no matter what, when you praise him, things will happen. When you praise him, things will change. I can't think of the rest. I'm quoting songs, but these songs are coming to my head. And I can't sing them because my voice is gone. But I want you to get the blessing of the words. When you praise him, things will happen. When you praise him, things will change. When you praise him, joy returns. When you praise him, strength is gained. When you praise him, heaven hears and the Lord is glorified. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. It's called a, an attitude of gratitude. Don't complain. Don't murmur. Don't backbite. Don't backstab. Don't use spite to get back. Don't be vindictive. Whatever you do, be careful how you handle the vicissitudes of life because it's not it's not the vicissitudes that is your test. It is how you respond to them. That's what God is looking for. He wants you to see where you are by how you respond to them. Are you quick and hasty to forgive? Or are you quick and hasty to get even? Which one are you? Whew. All right. Oh my goodness. Okay. Help me, Lord. Let's go to second. Whew. Let me see. What do we just come from here? <laughs> Gotta find my place. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Okay. Let's go to second Peter, I believe. Woo. First Peter. First Peter. First Peter. Okay. First Peter chapter one. Wow. Verse 2, chapter, sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2. Whew. All right. Sometimes I get a little emotional. I got to get my marbles back in place so I can function. All right, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Starting at verse 1. <clears throat> Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming is unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men. Disallowed, for some of you who don't know what that means, means rejected. So the living stone is Jesus Christ, who was rejected of men. But chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones, in other words, Jesus Jr., so to speak, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. There's the sacrifice, sacrifice of obedience, sacrifice of praise. When you are obeying, <clears throat> Like when I had to obey and cut Milton out of my life completely. I cried for God's help on that one. And God enabled me in such a way that I did not even miss Milton. Now, you know, that's a miracle. But I didn't even miss him. Why? God saw my sacrifice and he gave me the grace to see it through. I thought that that was it, y'all. I thought we were never going to hook up again. We'd blown it. We'd just blown it. That was the end of that. But one day, God said, time, ding. 
and the marriage proposal was on. And then God backed it by leading me to scripture and said, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And he led me to another scripture that talked about my land shall be married. He led me to scripture after scripture after scripture. I was so careful about making sure this was God. I never did tell Milton to this day that I would marry him. He just assumed the answer was yes. And we went to premarital counseling and then we got married. <laughs> So I just want you to know God honors obedience. Yes, he does. There were times when I was at the salon and there would be so much disrespect coming, 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 coming. And I had to keep my mouth shut and go to the bathroom and cry it out. And one day, one of the ladies did it publicly in such a way that I knew it was time. I knew in my spirit, it was time to deal with it. So I went up to her after she bawled me out publicly for something I didn't do. I asked her, please come with me into the kitchen right now. I need to talk to you. And she looked at me funny like, huh? Because I never spoke up for myself. And I walked her in that kitchen and I looked her dead in the eye. And I said, next time you want to disrespect me in public, you ask me some questions before you assume on the facts. Number one, the one who did that was the owner. It was just about the air conditioner. I said, number two, you have an issue with me? You treat me with the same respect I always treat you with. You pull me off in the corner and talk to me privately. Don't talk to me like I'm your child, like I'm some dog that you pulled off the street. Because I don't deserve that. I never treated you that way. So speaking up for yourself is okay. As long as you do it in the right spirit. Do you hear what I'm saying? She apologized. I was cool. I said, all right, we cool. That's the end of that. And that, it never came up again. And it never happened again either. So there are times when God will let you know it's time to speak up. But like Jesus did, he told people about themselves, didn't he? But he never committed a sin while doing so. So whatever you do, whatever you say, know that if Jesus was standing right next to that person, you could say and do the exact same thing without having to apologize, repent, or change your ways because you, because you know you didn't do anything wrong. You know you didn't say anything wrong. And you know you were not inappropriate while doing so. You had your attitude in check because you're representing your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, so we're going to move on, and I'm almost done. All right, so it says here, whoo, number six, verse six, wherefore also it is contained in scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Confound is another word for confused, discombobulated. Okay. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallow, which the builders rejected, that means. The same is made the head of the corner. The cornerstone is the first stone laid before you build that house. That's Jesus Christ. He's the builder of each of our houses and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now, this is what he is. The same is made the head of the corner, verse eight, and a stone of stumbling uh, and a rock of offense. Even actually means actually too. Okay. Even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Going back to verse 8, explaining a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. Listen, when Adam and Eve were in good, in good uh, relationship with God, having not committed sin, they would walk with him in the cool of the day, chit-chatting with the Lord, fellowshipping with the Lord. They were free, free, free. But once that sin had been committed, what were they doing? Running and hiding, weren't they? P 
peeping, slip and sliding, finding something to cover themselves up. When you are not right with the Lord, you don't even want to be around Jesus because he becomes a rock of offense to you. He becomes a stone of stumbling. Instead of you uh, taking a stroll with him, you're tripping over yourself trying to get away from him out of shame, out of guilt, because you know you're wrong. But when you know, listen, here's the thing. When you do wrong, but your heart is right, what do you do when you do wrong and your heart is right? Do you run from him? No, you run to him. Lord, I'm out of control. Lord, help me. Lord, I'm sorry. I don't want to disappoint you. I don't want to crucify you af afresh. Lord, help me. Strengthen me. Tell me what to do to get over this. Who do I tell? I don't want to keep doing this over and over again. You do whatever it takes to get the victory. And you pursue it like a bulldog uh, pursuing a piece of meat. You want righteousness and holiness so bad. We all fall short of the glory of God. We know that. But what do you do with your shortness? Do you run and hide with it and keep doing it? Or do you run to God, falling, crying for his mercy and his help, the supernatural power to give you the victory over it, which he will do? Yes, he does. What is it you do? Do you run to him, your, your cornerstone, or do you run from him as a rock of offense? See, when you're not about doing right, righteousness is offensive, y'all. That's why the world doesn't want to be around us. That's why the world doesn't want to hear about the name of Jesus. They don't want to hear about him, about his ways. They don't want to hear the word because all of this holiness is a rock of offense. It's like coming out of a cave. Let's say you've been living in the dark for 20 years. You've never been in the sunlight. Never. And somebody pulls you out of the dungeon to set you free. What's the first thing you're going to do when you come out into the daylight? You're going to cover your eyes because the sunlight will hurt you. It's offensive because all you know is the dark. Well, when you give your heart to the Lord, you come out of darkness into his marvelous light. At first, there are a lot of things that will be offensive to you. But stay there. Don't run. Don't run and hide. Because the more you stay in the light, the more you'll benefit. The more you run in God's face, the more you'll benefit. The more you cry out to him, the more your life will benefit. Stay with him, y'all. He is your winning ticket. Whatever you do, I don't care whether you're on top of your game or at the bottom in the gutter. Stay with him. He will deliver you out of them all when he knows your heart is crying out to him. So be encouraged no matter where you are with the Lord. Be encouraged and know that you have an advocate pulling for you. You have an advocate that understands he is touched. He is our, our high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And I got to stop because I don't want to go over time. God bless you. Be encouraged. God loves you. He is for you, not against you. Just whatever you do, don't be against him. Amen. Amen. <laughs>